英語聞き流し10分間名作リスニング英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロードその他の物語はホームページよりご利用いただけます 88thpp.com 88thpp.com A dog of Flanders Nello and Patrisky were left all alone in the world. They were friends in a friendship closer than brotherhood. Nello was a little Ardennes, Patrisky was a big Fleming. They were both of the same age by length of years, yet one was still young, and the other was already old. They had dwelt together almost all their days, both were orphaned and destitute, and owed their lives to the same hand. It had been the beginning of the tie between them, their first bond of sympathy, and it had strengthened day by day, and had grown with their growth, firm and indissoluble, until they loved one another very greatly. Their home was a little hut on the edge of a little village, a Flemish village a league from Antwerp, set amidst flat breadths of pasture and corn lands, with long lines of poplars and of alders bending in the breeze on the edge of the great canal which ran through it. It had about a score of houses and homesteads, with shutters of bright green or sky blue, and roofs rose red or black and white, and walls whitewashed until they shone in the sun like snow. In the center of the village stood a windmill, placed on a little moss grown slope, it was a landmark to all the level country round. It had once been painted scarlet, sails and all, but that had been in its infancy, half a century or more earlier, when it had ground wheat for the soldiers of Napoleon, and it was now a ruddy brown, tanned by wind and weather. It went queerly by fits and starts, as though rheumatic and stiff in the joints from age, but it served the whole neighborhood, which would have thought it almost as impious to carry grain elsewhere as to attend any other religious service than the mass that was performed at the altar of the little old grey church, with its conical steeple, which stood opposite to it, and whose single bell rang morning, noon, and night with that strange, subdued, hollow sadness which every bell that hangs in the low country seems to gain as an integral part of its melody. Within sound of the little melancholy clock almost from their birth upward, they had dwelt together, Nello and Patrisky, in the little hut on the edge of the village, with the cathedral spire of Antwerp rising in the northeast, beyond the great green plain of seeding grass and spreading corn that stretched away from them like a tideless, changeless sea. It was the hut of a very old man, of a very poor man, of old Jehan Doss, who in his time had been a soldier, and who remembered the wars that had trampled the country as oxen tread down the furrows, and who had brought from his service nothing except a wound which had made him a cripple. When old Jehan Doss had reached his full eighty, his daughter had died in the Ardennes, hard by Stavelot, and had left him in legacy her two-year-old son. The old man could ill contrive to support himself, but he took up the additional burden uncomplainingly, and it soon became welcome and precious to him. Little Nello, which was but a pet diminutive for Nicholas, throve with him, and the old man and the little child lived in the poor little hut contentedly. It was a very humble little mud hut indeed, but it was clean and white as a seashell, and stood in a small plot of garden ground that yielded beans and herbs and pumpkins. They were very poor, terribly poor, many a day they had nothing at all to eat. They never by any chance had enough, to have had enough to eat would have been to have reached paradise at once. But the old man was very gentle and good to the boy, and the boy was a beautiful, innocent, truthful, tender-hearted creature, and they were happy on a crust and a few leaves of cabbage, and asked no more of earth or heaven, save indeed that Patrisky should be always with them since without Patrisky where would they have been? For Patrisky was their Alpha and Omega, their treasury and granary, their store of gold and want of wealth, their breadwinner and minister, their only friend and comforter. Patrisky dead or gone from them, they must have laid themselves down and died likewise. Patrisky was body, brains, hands, head, and feet to both of them, Patrisky was their very life, their very soul. For Jihan Das was old and a cripple, and Nella was but a child, and Patrisky was their dog. A dog of Flanders, yellow of hide, large of head and limb, with wolf-like ears that stood erect, and legs bowed and feet widened in the muscular development wrought in his breed by many generations of hard service. Patrisky came of a race which had toiled hard and cruelly from sire to son in Flanders many a century, slaves of slaves, dogs of the people, beasts of the shafts and the harness, creatures that lived straining their sinews in the gall of the cart, and died breaking their hearts on the flints of the streets. Patrisky had been born of parents who had labored hard all their days over the sharp set stones of the various cities and the long, shadowless, weary roads of the two Flanders and of Brabant. He had been born to no other heritage than those of pain and of toil. He had been fed on curses and baptized with blows. Why not? It was a Christian country, and Patrisky was but a dog. Before he was fully grown he had known the bitter gall of the cart and the collar. Before he had entered his thirteenth month he had become the property of a hardware dealer who was accustomed to wander over the land north and south, 
from the Blue Sea to the Green Mountains. They sold him for a small price, because he was so young. This man was a drunkard and a brute. The life of Patrisky was a life of hell. To deal the tortures of hell on the animal creation is a way which the Christians have of showing their belief in it. His purchaser was a sullen, ill-living, brutal Brabant was, who heaped his cart full with pots and pans and flagons and buckets, and other wares of crockery and brass and tin, and left Patrisky to draw the load as best he might, whilst he himself lounged idly by the side in fat and sluggish ease, smoking his black pipe and stopping at every wine shop or café on the road. Happily for Patrisky, or unhappily, he was very strong, he came of an iron race, long born and bred to such cruel travail, so that he did not die, but managed to drag on a wretched existence under the brutal burdens, the scarifying lashes, the hunger, the thirst, the blows, the curses, and the exhaustion which are the only wages with which the Flemings repay the most patient and laborious of all their four-footed victims. One day, after two years of this long and deadly agony, Patrisky was going on as usual along one of the straight, dusty, unlovely roads that lead to the city of Rubens. It was full midsummer, and very warm. His cart was very heavy, piled high with goods in metal and in earthenware. His owner sauntered on without noticing him otherwise than by the crack of the whip as it curled round his quivering loins. The Brabant was had paused to drink beer himself at every wayside house, but he had forbidden Patrisky to stop a moment for a draught from the canal. Going along thus, in the full sun, on a scorching highway, having eaten nothing for twenty-four hours, and, which was far worse to him, not having tasted water for near twelve, being blind with dust, sore with blows, and stupefied with the merciless weight which dragged upon his loins, Patrisky staggered and foamed a little at the mouth, and fell. He fell in the middle of the white, dusty road, in the full glare of the sun, he was sick unto death, and motionless. His master gave him the only medicine in his pharmacy, kicks and oaths and blows with a cudgel of oak, which had been often the only food and drink, the only wage and reward, ever offered to him. But Patrisky was beyond the reach of any torture or of any curses. Patrisky lay, dead to all appearances, down in the white powder of the summer dust. After a while, finding it useless to assail his ribs with punishment and his ears with maledictions, the Brabant was, deeming life gone in him, or going so nearly that his carcass was forever useless, unless indeed some one should strip it of the skin for gloves, cursed him fiercely in farewell, struck off the leathern bands of the harness, kicked his body aside into the grass, and, groaning and muttering in savage wrath, pushed the cart lazily along the road uphill, and left the dying dog for the ants to sting and for the crows to pick. It was the last day before Kermesso away at Levan, and the Brabant was was in haste to reach the fair and get a good place for his truck of brass wares. He was in fierce wrath, because Patrisky had been a strong and much enduring animal, and because he himself had now the hard task of pushing his charrette all the way to Levan. But to stay to look after Patrisky never entered his thoughts, the beast was dying and useless, and he would steal, to replace him, the first large dog that he found wandering alone out of sight of its master. Patrisky had cost him nothing, or next to nothing, and for two long, cruel years had made him toil ceaselessly in his service from sunrise to sunset, through summer and winter, in fair weather and foul. He had got a fair use and a good profit out of Patrisky, being human, he was wise, and left the dog to draw his last breath alone in the ditch, and have his bloodshot eyes plucked out as they might be by the birds, whilst he himself went on his way to beg and to steal, to eat and to drink, to dance and to sing, in the mirth at Louvain. A dying dog, a dog of the cart, why should he waste hours over its agonies at peril of losing a handful of copper coins, at peril of a shout of laughter? Patrisky lay there, flung in the grass-green ditch. It was a busy road that day, and hundreds of people, on foot and on mules, in wagons or in carts, went by, tramping quickly and joyously on to Louvain. Some saw him, most did not even look, all passed on. A dead dog more or less, it was nothing in Brabant, it would be nothing anywhere in the world. After a time, among the holidaymakers, there came a little old man who was bent and lame, and very feeble. He was in no guise for feasting, he was very poorly and miserably clad, and he dragged his silent way slowly through the dust among the pleasure-seekers. He looked at Patrisky, paused, wondered, turned aside, then kneeled down in the rank grass and weeds of the ditch, and surveyed the dog with kindly eyes of pity. There was with him a little rosy, fair-haired, dark-eyed child of a few years old, who pattered in amidst the bushes, for him breast high, and stood gazing with a pretty seriousness upon the poor, great, quiet beast. Thus it was that these two first met, the little Nello and the big Patrisky. The upshot of that day was, that old Jihan Das, with much laborious effort, drew the sufferer homeward to his own little hut, 
which was a stone's throw off amidst the fields, and there tended him with so much care that the sickness, which had been a brain seizure brought on by heat and thirst and exhaustion, with time and shade and rest passed away, and health and strength returned, and Patrisky staggered up again upon his forced out, tawny legs. Now for many weeks he had been useless, powerless, sore, near to death, but all this time he had heard no rough word, had felt no harsh touch, but only the pitying murmurs of the child's voice and the soothing caress of the old man's hand. In his sickness they too had grown to care for him, this lonely man and the little happy child. He had a corner of the hut, with a heap of dry grass for his bed, and they had learned to listen eagerly for his breathing in the dark night, to tell them that he lived, and when he first was well enough to essay a loud, hollow, broken bay, they laughed aloud, and almost wept together for joy at such a sign of his sure restoration, and little Nello, in delighted glee, hung round his rugged neck with chains of marguerites, and kissed him with fresh and ruddy lips. So then, when Patrisky arose, himself again, strong, big, gaunt, powerful, his great wistful eyes had a gentle astonishment in them that there were no curses to rouse him and no blows to drive him, and his heart awakened to a mighty love, which never wavered once in its fidelity whilst life abode with him. But Patrisky, being a dog, was grateful. Patrisky lay pondering long with grave, tender, musing brown eyes, watching the movements of his friends. Now, the old soldier, Jihan Das, could do nothing for his living but limp about a little with a small cart, with which he carried daily the milk cans of those happier neighbours who owned cattle away into the town of Antwerp. The villagers gave him the employment a little out of charity, more because it suited them well to send their milk into the town by so honest a carrier, and bide at home themselves to look after their gardens, their cows, their poultry, or their little fields. But it was becoming hard work for the old man. He was eighty-three, and Antwerp was a good league off, or more. Patrisky watched the milk cans come and go that one day when he had got well and was lying in the sun with a wreath of marguerites round his tawny neck. The next morning, Patrisky, before the old man had touched the cart, arose and walked to it and placed himself betwixt its handles, and testified as plainly as dumb show could do his desire and his ability to work in return for the bread of charity that he had eaten. Jihan Das resisted long, for the old man was one of those who thought it a foul shame to bind dogs to labour for which nature never formed them. But Patrisky would not be gainsaid, finding they did not harness him, he tried to draw the cart onward with his teeth. At length Jihan Das gave way, vanquished by the persistence and the gratitude of this creature whom he had succoured. He fashioned his cart so that Patrisky could run in it, and this he did every morning of his life thenceforward. When the winter came, Jihan Das thanked the blessed fortune that had brought him to the dying dog in the ditch that fair day of Louvain, for he was very old, and he grew feebler with each year, and he would ill have known how to pull his load of milk cans over the snows and through the deep ruts in the mud if it had not been for the strength and the industry of the animal he had befriended. As for Patrisky, it seemed heaven to him. After the frightful burdens that his old master had compelled him to strain under, at the call of the whip at every step, it seemed nothing to him but amusement to step out with this little light green cart, with its bright brass cans, by the side of the gentle old man who always paid him with a tender caress and with a kindly word. Besides, his work was over by three or four in the day, and after that time he was free to do as he would, to stretch himself, to sleep in the sun, to wander in the fields, to romp with the young child, or to play with his fellow dogs. Patrisky was very happy. Ego